Bahaktang Gorgasali was born sometime around the year of 440, inside of the Kingdom of Iberia. He was the son of Mithridat V, the current king of Iberia. His mother's name was Sagdukt, and she was a princess from the neighboring Kingdom of Armenia. When translated into Iranian, Bahaktang translates to wolf-bodied, a great name for any future king to hold. I mean, wouldn't you be scared to fight someone who is literally a wolf man? Anyways, Prince Vahaktang's father, Mithridat V, dies and leaves Vahaktang as the 32nd king of Iberia. Nothing wrong with that until you realize that Vahaktang is only a 7 year old. He is crowned king in 447, this would leave his mother in charge of the kingdom until Vahaktang turned 16. Vahaktang couldn't turn 16 soon enough though, as his kingdom was under constant threat of raids from nomadic tribes to the north of Iberia. These tribes were most likely the Alans, that have long lived north of Iberia. The Alans weren't invading as much as they were running though. A new nomadic threat had arrived in the form of the Huns, who had pushed numerous Germanic Goths into the eastern and western Roman empires. In 456, these running Alan tribes raided their way into Ossetia and settled in the region in the north of Iberia. After the Alans had captured Vahaktang's sister, the newly independent ruling 16-year-old King Vahaktang would gather his army to face the Alans. Vahaktang gathered an army for nothing though, as there would be no battle between the two hosts. Instead, there would only be a duel. The duel would pit the 16-year-old king against the hand-picked champion of the Alans, who seemed a giant to his teenage opponent. And just as David had killed Goliath, Vahaktang would slay his much larger and older opponent. It looked like this wolf had some serious teeth. This secured the release of his sister and firmly planted Vahaktang's supremacy over the Alans. This would only be a temporary victory for his kingdom and people. Soon, he would be forced to fight the much larger Hunnic threat that had now crept its way closer and closer to the Caucasus Mountains. Luckily, these mountains provided a crucial obstacle that would make it hard for any nomadic tribe to cross. But still, the Huns raided his land. He would fight back against their raids in 460, when the neighboring kingdom of Albania attempted to gain independence from the Sassanid overlords to the south. This was Vahaktong's overlord as well, as the Sassanid Persians had made Iberia one of their vassal kingdoms about 40 years ago. Vahaktang may have thought about revolting along with Albania, until the king of Albania invited the raiding Huns into his kingdom so that they could fight the Sassanids for him. He assisted the Sassanids in kicking out the raiding Huns and helped them regain control over the area. Vahaktang assisted the Sassanids once again in 474 when the Sassanid Shah gathered an army to face the Huns in open battle. This was a bad idea, and the Shah was ambushed and captured by the Huns. Vahaktang now served an imprisoned king that was set up for ransom. This ransom payment would come from a very very unlikely place, and in the form of the Byzantine Emperor's ruler, Zeno. The Sassanid Shah would not let his capture go unpunished as he assembled another army to fight the Hunnic Horde. The Shah would once again be soundly defeated and captured though. This Shah was now thoroughly embarrassed, completely broke from having to pay his own ransom, and had a few vassals that wanted to exploit his apparent weakness. In 482, King Vahaktang ordered for the execution of Varsekin, who was a noble that was appointed to watch over him by the Sassanid Empire. This execution came when Varsekin had the daughter of the Armenian king, Vardan II, executed. Varsekin married the Armenian princess a few years ago, but grew appalled by her Christian religion. When she refused to give up Christianity in favor of Varsekin's Zoroastrianism, he had her killed. This martyr's death then triggered the Christian nations of Iberia and Armenia to revolt. At the same time that this revolt was starting, King Vahaktang married a relative of Emperor Zeno, moving himself closer and closer to the Roman Empire. And then in a stroke of brilliance, he asked for permission to create a separate church from that of the one headquartered in Constantinople. Then in one swoop, Vahaktang revolted against the Sassanids and created a Georgian Orthodox church to move closer toward an alliance with the Byzantine Empire. King Vahaktang knew that he couldn't face the Sassanids alone, so he created an alliance with King Vardan II of Armenia and an old enemy, the Huns. He was now employing a similar strategy that Albania had tried to use about 20 years earlier when they had tried to win their independence. This strategy would prove to produce similar results though. Two years after his revolution had started, King Vahaktang would be forced to flee to the neighboring Byzantine vassal state of Lazica, which encompassed much of the Colchis region to the west of Iberia. In an act of kindness, the victorious Sassanid Shah decided to put Vahaktang back onto the throne of Iberia. The restored Georgian king stopped rebelling against the Sassanids, who allowed him to keep the infant Georgian Orthodox Church. King Vahaktang in Iberia would then live in relative peace for the next 18 years. During these 18 years, the now aged king spent plenty of time hunting in the forests of Iberia. One day while he was navigating the forests that surround the Kura River, he noticed a white smoke rising above the forest canopy. His hunting falcon was already chasing a pheasant and flying towards the smoke. King Vahaktang followed, and was pleasantly surprised when he discovered that the smoke was from multiple hot springs that seemed to warm the air. 
He was less pleasantly surprised when he looked into one of the hot springs and discovered the boiled remains of his falcon that still clenched a pheasant in his talons. King Fahaktung enjoyed the hot spring so much that he decided to construct a new city to exploit the steamy warm clouds of water vapor. He would name the city Tbilisi, which translates to warm location. King Fahaktung was not the first Georgian king to settle this location, but he did start the process of constructing a city that was worthy enough to become the capital of Georgia up until the present day. 18 years of Iberian peace lasted until the Anastasian War broke out in 502. Shah Kavad of the Sassanid Empire declared war on the Eastern Roman Empire to take money that Eastern Rome had owed him. Kavad implored for Vaktung to join him, after all he was his vassal, but Vahaktung sided with his more religiously inlined neighbor of the Byzantines. This would result in the Sassanids invading Iberia and once again kicking Vahaktung out of Iberia. He would continue to fight against the Sassanids with his new Roman ally, but unfortunately, this would be the Wolf King's final war. While fighting the Sassanids, and at the age of 63, he was shot through a gap in his armor, located at his armpit. The king would be carried away to Ujarma Castle by his men, where he would die shortly after. In his will, King Vahaktung instructed his son, and the now King Dachi, to move the capital of Iberia to the newly constructed city of Tbilisi. The contributions that Vahaktung made to Georgian culture is staggering when considering that he created the Georgian Orthodox Church and put into word where he wanted the new capital to be. These two things that he left Georgia would both become hotbeds of Georgian culture, with Tbilisi becoming the seat of most of the future Georgian kings who would all adhere to the Georgian Orthodox Church.